Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have another great guest coming in, this time from Austin, Texas, where we actually we have a number of uh, people that I know in Austin, Texas. His name is Max Borders. He's the writer of the book Super Wealth. I appeared on a video with him a number of years ago. Uh, he also is the editor of the Freeman magazine at the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE. And he's also, and this is why I got in contact with him, he's also doing an, a really interesting looking conference called the Voice and Exit Con Conference. Uh, it's being held June 20th to 21st in Austin, Texas. And I'm just gonna play the video or the trailer for that uh, conference now because that's why I, I contacted Max, even though I already knew him, but I, I didn't know what he was up to. And I saw this and I, got, I thought this looks really interesting. So I'll play that trailer now, we'll, we'll come right back. The next stage of human social evolution isn't going to come out of mainstream thinking. It's going to be discovered by people operating at the frontier, creating a movement. That's why you have to find the dreamers and doers and give them the space to think subversive thoughts, to entertain crazy ideas, and to criticize by creating. We started Voice and Exit because we were frustrated with so many of the systems that have outlived their usefulness. Many of our laws and institutions are holding us back. They create a monoculture for people. Technology is connecting us in novel ways, and the pace of change is causing the old ways to show their cracks. There are some who are already weaving the latticework for the next generation of human interaction. New ways of thinking about law, culture, society, even our own minds and bodies. The goal is to maximize human flourishing and explore our highest potential. That's why Voice and Exit is not for everyone. People who are comfortable in the mainstream might not be prepared for this experience. At Voice and Exit, we share controversial, even radical ideas. And none of these ideas will ever come out of politics and small talk. This is the stuff of dreams, and we want to unleash the dreamers. There are those who stand up and fight within the old systems, dedicating themselves to battling the current status quo, inching out small victories that rarely take hold while the energy and resources for true creativity and innovation are sapped. We're done with the naysaying. We're done with the criticism. This is for people who are fed up with the old ways of making change, like sending your prayers up in the voting booth every other November. Voice and Exit is for those who are willing to question the orthodoxies, both of well-paid experts and officials. We challenge, and with every new creation, we usher in the next renaissance. This growing community of innovators, optimizers, and explorers is determined to accelerate progress towards these new paradigms. Rather than struggling and arguing, exiters are simply leaving outdated systems and creating new ones, systems that give rise to human flourishing. When we look out on the horizon, we see cities of beauty and wonder. And yet we're not impractical utopians. We are participants in humanity's great open source project. And we need those who are willing to criticize by creating. So as you can see, really interesting stuff. Uh, I see a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things. And Max isn't necessarily saying this is an anarchist conference or anything, but pretty much everything I saw there sounds like these are free thinkers, free-minded people who want to change the systems. And I think that's great because we, use, we can use all kinds of different uh, styles or ways of getting this information out there. Uh, for example, in Acapulco, which is our conference here in Acapulco, that's very out there. This is an anarcho-capitalist conference, and it's the only one of its type, actually, and we're, we'll be doing it again this upcoming year uh, in uh, February 2016, just about to announce the dates. And Max, I hope, will be a speaker there uh, because he's a great speaker, as you can see. And uh, and I hope his conference goes well. So uh, first of all, Max, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, first thing I have to ask you, though, and check your street credentials is, <laughs> how did you become an anarchist? <laughs> oh, gosh, it's been a long, uh, a long intellectual road. But I think the way I, the way I became an anarchist was really uh, disillusionment and disaffection with what I, when I with clinging to minarchism. Um, in all the ways I had, I had sort of built this edifice of, uh, of being an, a, a minarchist intellectual over many years. And sort of the last vestiges of those things, um, those areas I thought it was necessary to have some sort of you know, um, some sort of state, a minimal state to break log jams, to be a final decider, to make unitary decisions on behalf 
of a people, you know, this kind of mindset, I was, I was disappointed time and again by those last areas. And, I, you know, we learn so, so often that these areas disappoint us, um, the police, uh, the welfare warfare state. Uh, well, certainly not the, the welfare state. I was never a welfare status, but certainly I, um, I became disillusioned with, with uh, the, the military industrial complex, uh, with the police state, with the idea that there are angels staffed in government uh, that were somehow incorruptible. And I don't know, I mean, I had read all my public choice theory, but I just, I just over the years, uh, bitter experience led me to think that basically everything that government and its incentives and its incentive structure touches uh, really does become corrupted by power. And so um, I, I, became, um, I became an anarchist kicking and screaming, I guess you could say. But um, harsh reality taught me otherwise. One, th one little thing, if you don't mind my saying quickly, though, that I have... Uh, I have tried not to, to do is, is to erect another kind of intellectual edifice. I come from a philosophy background, and that's how I got into it first. But I've found that um, I've become something of a what one might call an asymptotic anarchist. That means the closer we can get to anarchy day by day through rather agorist means is probably the best way forward. In other words, the more we can eliminate force and coercion in the world in the best way we can relative to where we are is, is, is good. So, so for example, then I don't, I don't shit on people who want to run for office, for example, if they think that they can make the world. Are, are you running for office? Yeah, I don't know if you heard. Uh, no. I uh, just recently announced I'm running for the Libertarian Party of Canada. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's basically all anarcho-capitalists. And we're just doing it to get out there and talk to people and let people know about libertarianism. Uh, but I did receive a bit of flack for that from some anarchists who, who think that an anarchist could never, ever do anything like that. But <clears throat> it's mostly for, just like Ron Paul, marketing the ideas rather than, I, I don't want to rule people, believe me. I'll probably, yeah. if I win, I'll probably resign on the first day. I just don't, don't want to be involved. But I just want to get that uh, information out there. But keep, keep going. Go ahead. Well, and I think, I, think that's, uh, I, think you're, I think you're correct. And I understand that there are a lot of people who are purists out there. And it's not, it's not the path that they would take. I understand that. And I appreciate those folks. They may have other paths. But we have to have a pluralism of paths towards uh, mitigating and eventually, hopefully, eliminating uh, the coercive apparatus of the state. So some people do, some people write code, some people create wonderful, beautiful events like Anar um, um, Anarchopolco and Voice and Exit. And, and you know, we, we are all, uh, we're sort of these, these thousands of n little acts of defiance are, are building up, as, as James C. Scott says, uh, like a coral reef. And hopefully one day the ship of state will run aground on it. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the exact same way as you. Uh, that's sort of part of the reason I've been doing Anarchast all these years is, and I've been trying to have on all kinds of different people who are doing all kinds of different things, including movie directors and uh, people, uh, musicians and all kinds of people. I, of course, capitalists, which you are as well, people trying, entrepreneurs trying to create wealth. Um, and uh, they're all doing it through uh, their own different way. And I totally agree with that. And I think some people might have thought when I said I was running for office that I'm saying like every single anarchist has to run for office you have to get involved in the political system no not at all uh, it's only and walter block said this as well he said it's just one way of doing it but it is a way and like you said we need a pluralism of ways we just need to be hitting this from every single angle right now uh, to wake people up to get them to at least understand libertarianism in general uh, they don't have to necessarily be anarchists if everyone in the world turned minarchist and they just they had the smallest little governments everywhere and they kept their eye on it every day and made sure that it didn't didn't get too out of control i'd be pretty happy i'd probably almost retire and just go do some businesses and stuff uh because uh, there'd be so much more opportunity but uh you know uh, we talk about taking it the full way uh, which would be the best way f from a philosophical background. Uh, it's uh, totally immoral to force people to go into any sort of system, and that's what a uh, miniature system would be. Uh, so uh, many different takes on it. Um, let, before we get into your Voice and Exit conference, <clears throat> which I find really interesting, I, I really like what you've put together there, uh, I just want to ask you about the uh, Foundation 
for Econom Economic Education. I actually didn't know too much about FEE, which uh, is kind of stunning once I found out exactly what it is. It's been around for decades. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker works with them as well. And uh, he was telling me that that's sort of what woke him up to where he is today, to the anarchist he is today was the FEE. So I had no idea about it. So tell me about your relationship with them. Sure. And uh, it's, it's, I get out of bed almost every day and I pinch myself to think that I am the inheritor of this you know, these, these, these great publications um, uh, in terms of being a steward over them. So I'm the editor of The Freeman, which is a print magazine. And of course, we have a presence online uh, as well as sort of editor in chief over anything peaceful. I have two managing editors working with me, BK Marcus and Dan Beer, who are extremely talented guys. So we're really just trying to uh, beef this up. But the history of The Freeman goes back De decades. I mean, we're talking um, the Foundation for Economic Education under the leadership of Leonard Reed was um, acquired the Freeman, which was an independent publication in 1956. So not people like Nock were writing for and editing for the Freeman prior to that. I mean, this is a this is a an organization with a tremendous legacy. You know, um, Henry Hazlitt, Ludwig von Mises, you know, these are, I, I just, when I, some days when I wake up, I think there's, there's no way I can possibly carry this, this heavy torch. And yet, um, and yet I have to. And one of the big senses of responsibility I have with, with our mission these days at FEE is to get younger people involved, get them thinking in different ways. Um, and I, I can only think that Leonard Reed and, and Henry Hazlitt would be proud of what we've done. You know, Jeffrey Tucker is is an evangelist for these ideas. It's really great to work with him every day. He can be a real big pain in the ass sometimes um, because he's so good and he wants he wants things done certain ways. But um, but he's just an incredibly charming and talented person to work with. Um, you know, Lawrence Reed, who is our president, uh, is, is, is this sort of this bastion of, of old classical liberalism. So we're not all anarchists there, for example. We have so many different people with different perspectives working at FEE, you know, um, and we don't have any ideological purity tests. So we, we run lots of stuff as long as it's interesting and it's really about ideas and not about breastfeeding. Um, and, and that's the tradition that we inherited. And it's just absolutely fantastic. To, uh, to explore it, go back and see some of these old articles, and then create the new fee for today. Yeah, I was really sort of ashamed that I didn't know much about it. Um, I've always sort of seen it around. Uh, it's one of those things that was always sort of around, but I never looked into, and it was only until Jeffrey Tucker told me recently about how it started and its background and everything that uh, I, I was like, how did I not know about this? And then to find out that you're basically writing their, their, their articles or their uh, magazines and stuff is, uh, and your person I've known for a number of years, it just sort of just never entered into my radar for some reason, but I'm glad it did now. And uh, I believe Jeffrey Tucker, we haven't announced a, an Arcapoco for 2016, but it looks like he'll be coming. I don't want to make that official yet, he, uh, but it looks like he will be coming. It looks like you, you'll probably be coming. I so we're gonna, so. Have, we're gonna have a number of fee people there. So maybe we can, uh, uh, even promote fee at the conference, make them a sponsor or something to, to for other people who didn't realize it, uh, because it is an old sort of a thing. It's been around, I think, since the 60s, if I remember correctly. And um, so a lot of us are sort of 1946. Oh, 1946, even longer. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. And so for even for a person like myself, born in the 70s, I didn't really wake up to any of this stuff until around 2000. Uh, so I kind of uh, bypassed it and went straight to the Internet and LewRockwell.com and Doug Casey and all these kind of people uh, and didn't even really notice fee. So I think a lot of anarchists are narco capitalists for sure uh, need to uh, or at least should be aware of, of all they've been doing and what they are doing. I think it's great. I, I will mention uh, with great respect, uh, my predecessor's editor at the Freeman, uh, Sheldon Richman, is an enormously talented guy uh, who writes often for Reason Magazine now and is doing lots of other independent projects. He, he was with FFF for a while. Um, he was a, a, you know, a really good steward for many years of the publication. Uh, prior to Sheldon, uh, there were some there were some lean years, some years after the death of uh, Leonard Reed that 
they were sort of didn't know really what was going on. Don Boudreaux of, of Cafe Hayek was president in the past. Um, so there, there have been, you know, some sort of this back and forth. We, we really do now have this, um, this fresh start, I guess you could say, since about 2008 uh, with, with Larry Reed coming on board as the president. And fee has really become something of a juggernaut for some of the coolest stuff out there. I mean, we were among the first in the movement to just to pounce on Bitcoin. And that's basically basically because, you know, Jeff, uh, Jeff, I was into it because a guy here in Austin was like, you've got to get get some of this. And I was like, man, there's 10 steps to be able to acquire Bitcoin, you know. He's like, you should still, you should do it. And I wish I had, I would have been a very wealthy man if I had, even with the price where it is now. Um, but uh, whether or not you like Bitcoin, some of your, your uh, you probably have a lot of gold bugs on the show, but whatever you're into, we, we really do have this, this techno, techno agorist, techno anarchist spin on things that we are trying to bring to the movement that I think is a, is a unique position. Um, balanced with some of the other, you know, more classical humane values that, uh, that you would have found in the, in the Freeman or in fee publications over the years. So it's really an interesting animal and, uh, I won't bang on and on about it. I would just encourage folks to go to fee.org and check it out. Yeah. I think you're totally underestimating my audience because I think most of them love Bitcoin. Uh, I've been one of the biggest uh, on the, on the YouTube and uh, out there with my, the dollar vigilante, which is really the first financial newsletter to cover Bitcoin and really say that this is something that people need to get into uh, back in 2011 when it was around $3 uh, is uh, so yeah, you're definitely talking to you're preaching to the choir here as, as far as my audience on Bitcoin. It's huge. Even at an Arcapoco, we had an entire day. It was only a three day conference. An entire day was on cryptocurrencies, uh, or at least crypto. And uh, we're going to do the same thing again next year. Uh, we had Roger Veer there and a number of uh, amazing Bitcoin people. So yeah, no, we're on board with that as well. I'm, I'm surprised that we kind of missed each other in the dark over the last few years on a few of these things. I'm glad we uh, reconnected now. Uh, before again, before we get into your uh, Voice and Exit conference, which I really want to hear about, let's just talk a little bit about your book, Super Wealth. Why don't you tell people about that? Because this, of course, is uh, really a narco-capitalist focused show which I really encourage entrepreneurism and, and uh, gaining wealth. Uh, and so why don't you talk a little bit about that? I'm happy to. Um, this was a book published at the end of 2012, I think. Uh, it's been a while now. So um, you might call it, I mean, this was the beginning of the agitation uh, by the Occupy Wall Street movement against inequality. And inequality has become this now somewhat perennial thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's tr they're trying to make it an issue. Um, they're trying to sort of tap into what I would consider to be caveman instincts on, in on envy and indignation uh, with respect to wealth disparity. And what I try to bring with that book is to sort of dissolve this, this I, I would call it a fetish, inequality fetish. It's not to say that we should not be concerned about the poor. And I would challenge anyone anywhere of any ideological stripe who suggests that we should not care about poor people. If you, if you don't, that's, that's perfectly fine. But I think, but, but, but our, we have a general, um, most people have a general sense of compassion for people who are, uh, who uh, due to circumstances or, um, you know, inabilities or whatever, whatever uh, has cast them in the natural lottery, uh, to, to use the Rawlsian term, that we, sh that we should or shouldn't be concerned about them. I, th I think, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in, in strongly moral terms that you, sh you should do this with your money. What I'm saying is there is, there is nothing to be gained from thinking that we shouldn't be concerned about the poor. But the way we think about helping the lot of the poor in society is by thinking more about wealth creation and certainly a lot less about wealth distribution. We create all sorts of perverse effects for making people, and you and I talked about these to, to a great degree, helping the poor uh, via these, these mechanisms that make the poor dependent, create an underclass, and so on. And these, these kinds of perennial problems 
are something that I think the progressive left just absolutely refuses to look in, stare in the face. If you pay people to be poor, they will be poor and you will have more of them. So we have to find a sweet spot in how we help the poor and entrepreneurship and innovation has to be the start of it. And the freedom and free institutions, minarchist, anarchist, what have you, some sort of institutions that give rise to entrepreneurship and innovation has to be the starting point for helping the poor. Without that, it's a non-starter. Yeah, Stefan Molyneux has a great quote on that, past anarchist guest, of course, that uh, it's not anarchists who are putting hundreds of thousands of dollars onto uh, newly born babies in debt uh, via U.S. government debt or any government on earth, really. Uh, it's not anarchists putting them into indoctrination camps. Uh, <laughs> so the, when people say that we don't like the poor, uh, we, you know, some people might not care that much about the poor. I don't know them personally, individually. Most people I know, they, they care about human beings and they want the best for them. And the That's best right. way, as we know, is to have the freest market possible, which creates a lot of wealth, a lot of opportunities. Almost all the problems that poor people have today are all caused by government. It's caused by uh, they're, they're not able to move freely uh, because you need a passport or even uh, in certain other regions, you're just not allowed to move around. Uh, so you can't go to where there is work. Even look at uh, Mexico and the U.S. Even though there's more Mexicans leaving the U.S. now than going there, there is still a fair amount of poor Mexicans who wouldn't mind going to the U.S. because they can make a bit more money but they can't so they have to go in a train and then they get kidnapped and you know it's just crazy like that's the status way of helping uh, or not helping the poor and uh, and of course the war on poverty as you know that just created more poverty when you when you pay people to be poor as you pointed out you just incentivize people to be poor <laughs> it's, it's all incentives it just uh, it's just logical it's just rational and for people to think that um, because we're anarchists we don't care about poor people uh, it, for me personally, I can speak personally for myself. I care about all humanity, and that's why I am an anarchist, because I believe the best thing possible is to free all the humans and let them do whatever they want as long as they don't hurt anyone else. Um, so, yeah, we'll have a link to your book down below on that. I, I ha hadn't read it before, but you told me all about it, so it sounds great. And uh, But I, the reason I contacted you was about this conference. So it's called the Voice and Exit Conference. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about how you came up with this idea and what it's all about. Well, it's, it's funny because you, you never think a name, uh, a name of something that you want actually, people to actually come to and pay for would come out of a, a wonky uh, academic treatise. But there's a book that was written in the 70s by this man named Albert Hirschman who it identified something, what, uh, what I would call the human algorithm. Now, he never put it in these terms, but I think it's an important way. The, the book was called Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. And so Arnold Kling, who's a really interesting libertarian thinker, was, was blogging about this at the t uh, on about, I don't know, 2008 or so years ago. And he got me onto this Hirschman idea. And the idea is pretty simple. Uh, it can be summed up as follows. We, we have ways of making social change that take one of, of two, two tracks. We can exercise voice, which is communicating, agitating, trying to convince or persuade others to do something um, and to change a system from within. Now, this works sometimes. Sometimes you can say, you know, you really ought to do thus and so. In fact, I can help you do that. And so people say, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. So you change your system from within. But sometimes we don't have uh, the ability to persuade others to change our system. Can you imagine trying to uh, persuade the US uh, Federal Reserve to stop printing money, for example? So in this case, uh, someone came along, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, I guess, and said, look, we're going to try something else. We're going to fork the code. And I mean this uh, in, in both the literal and figurative senses. We're going we're to create a new system in parallel, and we're going to allow you to adopt it. And it's going to be better, faster, and cheaper than the one we left behind. So exit is really the aspect of this event that we want to celebrate. But it's not just about opting out. Opt-out culture is certainly something that we want to help, um, you know, people celebrate. But it's also the idea of opting in, being creative. We have this mantra that I stole from Michael Strong, and Michael Strong, my friend, uh, stole it from Michelangelo, the painter, and it is criticized by creating. And the idea of criticism through creation is just, yeah, there's just so much jaw jaw and voice that's going to work. Of course. Uh, conference is devoted to Jaw Jaw, so I don't want to I don't want to put it down too much. 
but at some point you got to get out there and roll up your sleeves and get something done. And so the innovators who are out there doing that, the Satoshis of the world, the Bitcoin coders who followed on, who are contributing to the source code of the blockchain, um, the people who, like Michael Strong, who are working on startup cities in Honduras, uh, which are imperfect but far, far better solutions than the status quo. Um, we've got seasteaders who are out there who are working right now to, to create the specs for the first uh, uh, floating business platforms. And I mean, there's Liberland now too. I don't know if you heard about this. It's a new narco capitalist country in Europe. I'm on my way over there in a couple of weeks. Uh, so yeah, people are creating all over the place. That's what it's all about. That's right. And this sort of techno agorism, I, I put techno in front of it because um, you know, some agorists are really uh, not into the technical stuff. I tend to, to go in that direction. I think there's a lot of promise in some of these technological solutions. Because when we have network effects, when we are able to look, look at what you and I are doing right now, you know, th this, this, this um, interchange that we're having right now uh, through Bits and Bytes and celebrating and, uh, with all your viewers and listeners is, is something to be ce celebrated in the great swath of human history, right? We could be collaborating right now on the, great, on the next big venture. Someone who's listening right now could show up to an Arcapulco or Voice and Exit with the next great business idea or innovation that changes the world. That is the kind of stuff that comes out of this, um, this great open source project, as I put it in that video. And I think it's, it's a fantastic way to live, um, to live anarchy. Yeah, absolutely. It's. Uh, I was even thinking about uh, for taglines for the upcoming Arcapoco conference. I had. Uh, I'm still thinking of ideas. If anyone has a good one, but uh, the one I came up with today was create a new reality. Um, and so I'm. I'm very much on the same wavelength as you. The only thing I'm doing a little different is I'm out there saying this is an anarcho capitalist conference because there wasn't one. Uh, there was no real international large anarcho capitalist conference, and we're doing it. So, uh, yeah, th that's what I've said ever since I started Anarchast, and so many people have started so many great things. I've had so many people come on. So many people came to Narcopoco with great ideas, uh, including a Ryan Martin who's doing the Sidekick app, which sort of defeats the police state all through technology and nonviolence, uh, and uh, all kinds of great things. So. Uh, I, I know we have so many people up in the Austin area because that's a kind of a crypto area as well. I'm on the crypto show there all the time. I know Cody Wilson and everybody up there. Uh, and uh, so uh, I want to let people know. So it's coming up uh, in uh, less than a month now, uh, June 20th to 21st in Austin. It looks great. Uh, I can't go because I don't go to the U.S. anymore uh, for, I think, <laughs> fairly obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, I'm glad you guys are sticking it out and then trying to change things up there. That's that's great, so I'll support you from here. Uh, <laughs> and I know you. also that you uh, are offering, and this is capitalism, anarcho-capitalism here, you're offering a 20% discount just to our viewers and listeners. Uh, so we're gonna have a link to that down below on YouTube if you're listening on the radio anywhere in the world, and we'll let Max give us the website, but go to the Voice and Exit website and just type in for the discount code, just type ANARCHAST in all caps, that's A-N-A-R-C-H-A-S-T, and you get a 20% discount, and I'm, I get a 10% commission. That's a pure and capitalism it's beautiful yeah absolutely um, and that's not why I'm promoting this conference by the way I didn't even know about the affiliate thing until uh, no. just today really but uh, I wanted to contact you because the conference looks amazing no I mean these are the kind of folks um, you know we just want to get there you know we're we think we're building something special and we're this this ethos and this aesthetic that we're working on and we're collaborating with um, you know it is you know, voice and exit really is for 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 a much wider audience, and um, and yet all the ideas are there. We just strip off the labels, um, but that we're doing these these kinds of projects, that we're iterating, that we're forming community around these ideas, is absolutely critical to keeping this momentum going that we've got right now. And I think um, I think we have a we have a generation. Uh, before us, and I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of an old guy, so I, I feel comfortable saying this, but we've got a generation of people younger, far younger than I am, who have grown up as digital natives, and they don't understand anything but the idea of forking codes and, and Facebook governance. Like, 
if you're if things free and uh, yeah. fast and works and uh, they don't understand any of this government stuff it's like what's that all about that doesn't <laughs> work why would anyone want that with all this debt that they say i owe <laughs> uh this social socialist insecurity as i call it that i'll never get uh, so yeah they're they're just like what and they're just moving on absolutely so i mean that's what we find with with the kind of folks who show up to voice and exit is that they're extremely receptive to the ideas um and in you know whether that's you know the latest in crypto innovations or or seasteading i mean people are really captivated by some of this stuff and um you know if it's almost like if you don't irritate people's ideological immune systems um, they're really willing to listen. And so that's what we've found. On the other hand, what you're doing with this is you're forming a core community. So it's a, di so we, the, the bottom line is we trying both to meet bring out like thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of people who will do things like what you're doing and just go out there and you don't have to say the word anarchy, even libertarianism, just go, Hey, this is the future. And, uh, and people get excited about it if you don't really bring up all these words that they're all scared of. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of what I'm doing is trying to create this sort of, you know, trying to bring the community together as well. There was no real community for r real anarchists, uh, not the communal anarchists or anarchists communists who aren't really anarchists as far as I can tell uh, but like people like us uh, anarcho-capitalists or just people who just believe in the non-aggression principle and who have seen through philosophy or uh, through philosophy that government is immoral or who have just looked at it pragmatically and, and looked at things and say it's just not working mm -hmm. uh, and that whole community has been sort of disparate and that's why I, even with uh, fee I wasn't even fully aware of them so this needs to be kind of like put together a little bit of a community and that's sort of what I've been trying to do and that's what Anarchapoco is all about but what you're trying to do is get that out to people who've never even heard these ideas before. Exactly, exactly and and we need we need both of those functions which is why this is uh, these kinds of projects are so interesting but they're also really risky at least from from my perspective it's like it is it is exceedingly hard people have an aspirational identity and sometimes that's associated with label. Um, and so if pe sometimes people ask me, so what is Voice and Exit? What is it about? And I scratch my head and I go, well, it's about lots of cool different stuff, you know, kind of like TED Talks and there's a big party and, <laughs> and it's, it's visually just, you know, blah, and I say, wait a minute. And then I have to get back to our roots and it's like, okay, what, what are we about? We're about human flourishing. We're about people who being free and flourishing and that's really what it's all about and if you're interested in that you will love this conference yeah i uh am it's a great website by the way i want you to let people know the website uh, i'm actually going to try to copy a lot of it for our upcoming on Arcapoco because it's so well done why don't you let people know the website uh, where they can go and find out more information sure thing it's voiceandexit.com voiceandexit.com you can find um, you can find not only the videos from the past so there's in, there's stuff on open source law from uh, Tom W Bell um, startup cities seasteading but we also have stuff for uh, for other dimensions of human flourishing so if you're into biohacking if you're into uh, nootropics and personal improvement there's a, there are videos and ideas on that as well it's about the complete flourishing human being so You'll, get, you'll find it all there. So even if you can't come, we really encourage you to come uh, become part of the Exeter community and uh, find out what we're up to. Yeah, that's great. And like I said, we'll have a link down below. If you click on that, you'll get 20% discount and I'll make some money. We're all anarcho-capitalists here. Uh, or if you just go to the website, just type in the discount code Anarchast. And so that's basically it for Anarchast. Really like to thank Max. I, I hope he uh, comes down here for an Arcapoco. Sounds like he will. And uh, and I hope he, I wish him all the best of luck with his conference. Uh, for anyone else watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, share. Just press the little buttons down there and that's how this information gets out there. It's really easy. That's how you change the world and uh, we'll have more information coming up on Anarchapoco coming out soon as well so uh, that's it for Anarchast your home for Anar uh, <laughs> Anarcho your home for Anarchapoco that's it for Anarchast your home for anarchy on the internet peace love and anarchy when you consider that you have to spend all your time 
basically unteaching what your kids just learned. <laughs> So not only must the government recognize natural rights, but the government can't disparage them. Unfortunately, the people in the government have a hold in their copy uh, where the Second Amendment is, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. So, you know, this is not so saintly. I mean, you know, because he's got the reputation of favoring, uh, you know, ending slavery. But he wasn't an opponent of slavery. Uh, the abolitionists were opponent of slavery, but not Abe Lincoln. I mean, the actual argument and the explanation is pretty darn simple. I mean, it's, it's so simple as to almost be self-evident. I mean, things like self-ownership and the non-aggression principle, it's, it takes about three seconds to demonstrate that government can't be legitimate. Well, I, th I think uh, human beings have the right to shape their own reality. And that's what's been taken away from us. We are participating involuntarily in a system that shapes our reality for us. And the first step is to not allow that. You're paying off your debt, you have to pay off your car loans, your mortgage, you have to maybe even live with your parents, and then you look back at your life and you did nothing. You never challenged yourself, you never experienced anything, you never lived your life because you kept doing what the machine told you to do. From Acapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast exact same way as you uh, that's sort of part of the reason I've been doing Anarchast all these years is and I've been trying to have on all kinds of different people who are doing all kinds of different things including movie directors and uh, people uh, musicians and all kinds of people of course capitalists which you are as well people trying entrepreneurs trying to create wealth um, and uh, they're all doing it through uh, their own different way and I totally agree with that and I think some people might have thought when I said I was running for office that I'm saying like every single anarchist has to run for office you have to get involved in the political system? No, not at all. Uh, it's only, and Walter Block said this as well, he said it's just one way of doing it, but it is a way, and like you said, we need a pluralism of ways. We just need to be hitting this from every single angle right now uh, to wake people up, to get them to at least understand libertarianism in general. Uh, they don't have to necessarily be anarchists. If everyone in the world turned minarchist and they just, they had the smallest little governments everywhere and they kept their eye on it every day and made sure that it didn't, didn't get too out of control, I'd be pretty happy. I'd probably almost retire and just go do some businesses and stuff uh, because uh, there'd be so much more opportunity but uh, you know uh, we talk about taking it the full way uh, which would be the best way f from a philosophical background uh, it's uh, totally immoral to force people to go into any sort of system and that's what a miniature system would be uh, so uh, many different takes on it um, let, before we get into your voice and exit conference <clears throat> which I find really interesting I, I really like what you put together there uh, I just want to ask you about the uh, foundation for economic economic education. I actually didn't know too much about FEE, which uh, is kind of stunning once I found out exactly what it is. It's been around for decades. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker works with them as well. And uh, he was telling me that that's sort of what woke him up to where he is today, to the anarchist he is today was the FEE. So I had no idea about it. So tell me about your relationship with them. Sure. And uh, it's, it's, I get out of bed almost every day and I pinch myself to think that I am the inheritor of this, you know, these, these, these great publications um, uh, in terms of being a steward over them. So I'm the editor of The Freeman, which is a print magazine, and of course we have a presence online, uh, as well as sort of editor-in-chief over anything peaceful. I have two managing editors working with me, BK Marcus and Dan Beer, who are extremely talented guys. So we're really just trying to uh, beef this up, but the history of the Freeman goes back de decades. I mean, we're talking um, the Foundation for Economic Education under the leadership of Leonard Reed was um, acquired the Freeman, which was an independent publication in 1956. So not people like Nock were writing for and editing for the Freeman prior to that. I mean, this is a this is a an organization with a tremendous legacy. You know, um, Henry Hazlitt, Ludwig von Mises. You know, these are. I I just when I some days when I wake up, I think there's there's no way I can possibly carry this this heavy torch, and yet um, and yet I have to. And one of the big senses of responsibility I have with, with our mission these days at FEE is to get younger people involved, get them thinking in different ways. Um, and I, I can only think that Leonard Reed and, and Henry Hazlitt would be proud of what we've done. You know, Jeffrey Tucker is, is an evangelist for these ideas. 
It was really great to work with him every day. He can be a real big pain in the ass sometimes um, because he's so good and he wants, he wants things done certain ways. But, um, but he's just an incredibly charming and talented person to work with. Um, you know, Lawrence Reed, who is our president, uh, is, is, is this sort of this bastion of, of old classical liberalism. So we're not all anarchists there, for example. We have so many different people with different perspectives working at FEE, you know, um, and we don't have any ideological purity tests. So we, we run lots of stuff as long as it's interesting and it's really about ideas and not about breastfeeding. Um, and, and that's the tradition that we inherited. And it's just absolutely fantastic to, uh, to explore it, go back and see some of these old articles and then create the new fee for today. Yeah, I was really sort of ashamed that I didn't know much about it. Um, I've always sort of seen it around. Uh, it's one of those things that was always sort of around, but I never looked into. And it was only until Jeffrey Tucker told me recently about how it started and its background and everything that uh, I, I was like, how did I not know about this? And then to find out that you're basically writing their 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 articles or their uh, magazines and stuff is, uh, and your person I've known for a number of years, it just sort of just never entered into my radar for some reason, but I'm glad it did now. And uh, I believe Jeffrey Tucker, we haven't announced a, an Arcapoco for 2016, but it looks like he'll be coming. I don't want to make that official yet, he, uh, but it looks like he will be coming. It looks like you, you'll probably be coming. I so we're gonna, so. Have, we're gonna have a number of fee people there. So maybe we can, uh, uh, even promote fee at the conference make them a sponsor or something to to for other people who didn't realize it uh, because it is an old sort of a thing it's been around i think since the 60s if i remember correctly and um so a lot of us are sort of 1946 oh 1946 even yeah. longer that's amazing <laughs> Yeah. And so for even for a person like myself, born in the 70s, I didn't really wake up to any of this stuff until around 2000. Uh, so I kind of uh, bypassed it and went straight to the Internet and LouRockwell.com and Doug Casey and all these kind of people uh, and didn't even really notice fee. So I think a lot of anarchists or narco capitalists for sure uh, need to uh, or at least angels staffed in government uh, that were somehow incorruptible. And I don't know. I mean, I had read all my public choice theory, but I just, I just, over the years, uh, bitter experience led me to think that basically everything that government and its incentives and its incentive structure touches uh, really does become corrupted by power. And so um, I, I, became, um, I became an anarchist kicking and screaming, I guess you could say, but um, harsh reality taught me otherwise. One, th one little thing, if you don't mind my saying quickly, though, that I have, uh, I have tried not to, to do is, is to erect another kind of intellectual edifice. I come from a philosophy background, and that's how I got into it first. But I've found that um, I've become something of a what one might call an asymptotic anarchist. That means the closer we can get to anarchy day by day through rather agorist means is probably the best way forward. In other words, the more we can eliminate force and coercion in the world in the best way we can relative to where we are is, is, is good. So, so for example, then I don't, I don't shit on people who want to run for office, for example, if they think that they can make the world. Are, are you running for office? Yeah, I don't know if you heard. Uh, no. I uh, just recently announced I'm running for the Libertarian Party of Canada. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's basically all anarcho-capitalists. And we're just doing it to get out there and talk to people and let people know about libertarianism. Uh, but I did receive a bit of flack for that from some anarchists who, who think that an anarchist could never, ever do anything like that. But <clears throat> it's mostly for, just like Ron Paul, marketing the ideas rather than, I, I don't want to rule people, believe me. I'll probably, yeah. if I win, I'll probably resign on the first day. I just don't, don't want to be involved. But I just want to get that uh, information out there. But keep, keep going. Go ahead. Well, and I think, I, think that's, uh, I, think you're, I think you're correct. And I understand that there are a lot of people who are purists out there. And it's not, it's not the path that they would take. I understand that. And I appreciate those folks. They may have other paths. But we have to have a pluralism of paths towards uh, mitigating and eventually, hopefully, eliminating uh, the coercive apparatus of the state. So some people do, some people write code, some people create wonderful, beautiful events like Anarcho um, um, Polco and Voice and Exit. And, and you know, we, we are all, uh, we're sort of, 
these, these thousands of little acts of defiance are, are building up, as, as James C. Scott says, uh, like a coral reef. And hopefully one day the ship of state will run aground on it. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I feel that. Everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have another great guest coming in this time from Austin, Texas, where we actually we have a number of uh, people that I know in Austin, Texas. His name is Max Borders. He's the writer of the book Super Wealth. I appeared on a video with him a number of years ago. Uh, he also is the editor of the Freeman Magazine at the Foundation for Economic Education (FEE). And he's also, and this is why I got in contact with him, he's also doing an, a really interesting looking conference called the Voice and Exit Con Conference. Uh, it's being held June 20th to 21st in Austin, Texas. And I'm just going to play the video or the trailer for that uh, conference now because that's why I, I contacted Max, even though I already knew him, but I, I didn't know what he was up to. And I saw this and I, got, I thought this looks really interesting. So I'll play that trailer now. We'll, we'll come right back. The next stage of human social evolution isn't going to come out of mainstream thinking. It's going to be discovered by people operating at the frontier, creating a movement. That's why you have to find the dreamers and doers and give them the space to think subversive thoughts, to entertain crazy ideas, and to criticize by creating. We started Voice and Exit because we were frustrated with so many of the systems that have outlived their usefulness. Many of our laws and institutions are holding us back. They create a monoculture for people. Technology is connecting us in novel ways, and the pace of change is causing the old ways to show their cracks. There are some who are already weaving the latticework for the next generation of human interaction. New ways of thinking about law, culture, society, even our own minds and bodies. The goal is to maximize human flourishing and explore our highest potential. That's why Voice and Exit is not for everyone. People who are comfortable in the mainstream might not be prepared for this experience. At Voice and Exit, we share controversial, even radical ideas. And none of these ideas will ever come out of politics and small talk. This is the stuff of dreams, and we want to unleash the dreamers. There are those who stand up and fight within the old systems, dedicating themselves to battling the current status quo, inching out small victories that rarely take hold, while the energy and resources for true creativity and innovation are sapped. We're done with the naysaying. We're done with the criticism. This is for people who are fed up with the old ways of making change, like sending your prayers up in the voting booth every other November. Voice and Exit is for those who are willing to question the orthodoxies, both of well-paid experts and officials. We challenge, and with every new creation, we usher in the next renaissance. This growing community of innovators, optimizers, and explorers is determined to accelerate progress towards these new paradigms. Rather than struggling and arguing, exiters are simply leaving outdated systems and creating new ones, systems that give rise to human flourishing. When we look out on the horizon, we see cities of beauty and wonder. And yet we're not impractical utopians. We are participants in humanity's great open source project. And we need those who are willing to criticize by creating. So as you can see, really interesting stuff. Uh, I see a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things. And Max isn't necessarily saying this is an anarchist conference or anything, but pretty much everything I saw there sounds like these are free thinkers, free-minded people who want to change the systems. And I think that's great because we, use, we can use all kinds of different uh, styles or ways of getting this information out there. Uh, for example, in Acapulco, which is our conference here in Acapulco, that's very out there. This is an anarcho-capitalist conference, and it's the only one of its type, actually. And we're, we'll be doing it again this upcoming year uh, in uh, February 2016, just about to announce the dates. And Max, I hope, will be a speaker there uh, because he's a great speaker, as you can see. And, uh, and I hope his conference goes well. So uh, first of all, Max, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, first thing I have to ask you, though, and check your street credentials is, <laughs> how did you become an anarchist? <laughs> oh, gosh, it's been a long, uh, a long intellectual road. But I think the way I, the way I became an anarchist was really uh, disillusionment and disaffection with 
what I, when I with clinging to minarchism, um, in all the ways I had, I had sort of built this edifice of, uh, of being an, a, a minarchist intellectual over many years. And sort of the last vestiges of those things, um, those areas I thought it was necessary to have some sort of you know, um, some sort of state, a minimal state to break log jams, to be a final decider, to make unitary decisions on behalf of a people, you know, this kind of mindset. I was, I was disappointed time and again by those last areas. And, I, you know, we learn so often that these areas disappoint us, um, the police, uh, the welfare warfare state. Uh, well, certainly not the, the welfare state. I was never a welfare status, but certainly I, um, I became disillusioned with, with uh, the, the military industrial complex, uh, with the police state, with the idea that there are